my name is Dirk Schoenmaker, and I'm really happy to see such a full room. That means that sustainable finance is a hot topic. We had a hot summer, so we now know why sustainable finance is needed, if we didn't know before. And um, we have a really great panel, both from the public and the private sector, and I think this is really one of the topics where public and private sector are uh, quite closely aligned, uh, and that's really uh, promising to see. Before I introduce the panel, I would like to uh, introduce a new paper on this topic. Uh, so it will be for 10, 15 minutes. And then we go straight uh, to the discussion in the panel. And then the last 15 minutes we spend also on questions from the floor. So I prefer to stand if I present. So how to do it? Um, so. Um, uh, there is a remarkable rise of sustainable investment that is really getting very large. And, uh, and it also is a new approach how companies look at the issues. Uh, then I will discuss the policy propos uh, proposals from the Commission, which are now discussed in Parliament, and then also so offer some, an extra idea how to get sustainable investing really uh, going faster. So last year, uh, I had that Broeckland essay out why we should do it, why we should include the social and environmental dimension. Um, and today is the question how to do it, so how to get going. And I think there are two, uh, in the paper there are two issues on the table. Should we have an official taxonomy or should it be more left to the market? That's issue number one. And issue number two is, can we really rely on all these ESG ratings which are uh, increasingly published, or should we do fundamental investing? And these are some numbers, and uh, you see Europe is at the top. It is really, we are 53% of assets under, manage, assets under management are now managed in a sustainable way, and it's really a lot. Uh, US is, uh, obviously uh, behind, but like Canada, um, Asia is still low, but it's really catching on. So that was one or two years earlier, 1%. So Asia is really getting started and uh, growing extremely fast. Um, so why would we do ESG? Huh? Uh, for most people, it makes a lot of sense to, to look at these issues, but economists always have difficulty with it because if it is not priced, then we should ignore it, because that's what our theory books tell us. And, um, well, uh, one way is anticipating a regulation, and before we started, I discussed with, with Molly also the need for a higher carbon tax, and uh, that is, is going to come. We don't know when, but that is on the rise, that is clear. Uh, pressure from your consumers, uh, your reputation, NGOs, but the most important one, I think, is really future proof. If you have a business model based on fossil fuels, and then in 2050 it is already erased out, but earlier we, uh, we already reduce it. If you're still in the high carbon, uh, these companies will go, uh, they will be faded out. So if you don't move in time, uh, you, you will be on the wrong side. And finance, is about anticipating uh, things. You make an investment, you make a bank loan with a future prospect that the company is repaying. And if the business model of the company is not future-proof, you will uh, lose your own money. So I think there's an extremely strong incentive for the financial sector and the underlying real economy uh, to move. So what I would like to introduce shortly is the concept of long-term value creation. And that basically means that we take the social and environmental issues into account uh, next to the financial uh, dimension. And companies, of course, can choose the degree of sustainability uh, in their model. And it's also, of course, about the transition. I come to the back later. And then if we go to the textbooks uh, which we currently use uh, in education. At, at, I'm at a business school uh, in Rotterdam. It's all about maximizing profits, shareholder value, and, um, and clearly that misses the, the social and environmental dimension. So we really need to broaden our scope to the stakeholder model where we in continental Europe are 
uh, more used to, but we also need to do that in our calculations. Um, it is possible, the only thing is you need to want to do it. Um, and institutional investors are really uh, a driving force. The big pension funds, I'm from the Netherlands, uh, and the, the large pension funds are all on sustainable investing, and you see that across Europe. Um, and in the end, um, there is academic research. If you really focus on the relevant ESG issues for each company is different. Uh, for your company, the relevant ESG issues in the end, that comes back in your financial performance. And there's no surprise because it is about your business model and the underlying factor is often management quality. Good management helps for good profit, but also helps to be forward looking. Um, okay, just to show you that the institutional investors, the numbers are in the paper, are 65% of equities are held by institutional investors. Uh, so there's really... Uh, the, the driving force uh, behind this push. Okay, the policy proposals. Uh, you probably all know the, the action plan based on the high-level expert group. Uh, I picked three items out of it. There is more into it. Uh, the classification uh, system, the taxonomy. Second, uh, investor duty. And third, uh, disclosure. And on number two and three, I'm not going to spend a lot of time because they are extremely sensible. So if we include them in the duty, fiduciary duty of professors, nobody can say anymore, why should I pay attention to it? Because you're obliged uh, to do it. It is in the interest of your client to incorporate these issues. So number two is very powerful. My main discussion will be the taxonomy. So. It is useful to know also for retail clients that you have some labels, standards, uh, and if we make a low carbon index. So for that, it is extremely useful, and there's now a technical group working on it uh, uh, in getting all the, all the criteria, and they will advise the commission. But I have one issue I would like to raise is if we make the taxonomy too leading, too administrative, then it could backfire, because in the end, this is all about transition. We transition from a brown to a green economy, and some companies are already there, but most have to uh, have to move from A to B. Uh, and this transition is very difficult to, to fix in a rating or in a definition, because that, that needs judgment. So you get this, I would call it uh, the Schumpeter, uh, I don't know whether there's anybody from Austria in the room, uh, the, this creative destruction of Schumpeter. So this transition to a low carbon economy, they will have winners and losers. Um, and we cannot predict that. In addition, the large guys, they will lobby the commission that their company is inside. And the small companies who are innovative, uh, often sustainable, they have no time to lobby, they are working. Uh, they are left out. Uh, with this extra argument, it's uncertain and unproven. Yes, any new technology is uncertain and unproven. And, uh, and we can see it from the emission standards on the cars, where uh, the, the parliament and the commission were trying to be tight, and then it was lobbied down. Uh, we, I don't have to explain that. Alternative is leave it to the market, but then you would say, okay, can we trust the market? But their money is at stake, and uh, in the sake of time, I have to move on, but these three are ESG-based, and this is really fundamental investing that you look into the company. And although we have a lot on ESG ratings, I want to warn you a little bit. Um, it is based on reported data, not always material issues, Operation, so a tobacco company can be relatively okay because what matters are the product. So be careful, like with credit ratings, remember how you could buy uh, subprime triple A uh, CDOs, and we know what happened. So be careful, and what you see is the ratings are not really correlated, so that shows their weakness. Um, so on paper, we have a lot of ESG investment, but we don't really see the sustainability outcomes moving. 
and uh, my proposal, and uh, it's coming out also in a new book uh, next month, for, for educating the students. So to tell the students, it's not about finance, but it's about finance, social, and environmental value together. And that you put them together, but that you really need to do fundamental analysis of the companies you're investing in. There is no way out. You have to check the business model. And then four points. Long horizon, uh, active management. You don't need 3,000 equities in your portfolio for diversification. After 50 or 100, you've already got your benefits. This is standard deviation variance. So after 100 shares, the, the variance is already dealt with. You have your diversification benefits. Because if you invest in only 50 or 100 companies, then you really know what is going on and you can do real engagement with the company. And then, as investor, you can help out the company to move quicker uh, to, to a sustainable business model. And that, that requires only one thing, and it would be interesting to see what also the panel has to say at the U later on, that we move away from these market benchmarks and that we have to keep the FTSE 100, otherwise we are not performing well, but move to absolute returns. In the paper, you will find an example of Alecta who's doing this approach, and quite successfully. They have a five-year average as their, uh, as their uh, uh, target, rather than a benchmark. Finishing off, so fundamental analysis uh, of business model uh, to really see whether they're moving uh, to a, a sustainable future. What, what is their approach? Do they have a credible transition path? And then um, be careful with the taxonomy. It will be useful for retail clients so they know what they're buying, but be careful to impose it on institutional investors because you may lose momentum, which we have today, where the leading uh, insurance companies and pension funds are really following this uh, fundamental approach. Thanks a lot. So, I have a double hat today, so now I put my hat on as chair. And, um, uh, and we are really uh, happy that we have a broad panel. Uh, Alan Deckers uh, uh, from DG Visma being involved in this uh, project. But I think but you, was that for two years that you are now working on it in the, the commission is working on this project? Yes. Yeah. So it's really a uh, long-term project and also ongoing, even if there is a change. Uh, Ellen is head of uh, unit uh, of accounting and financial reporting. Next, we will have Molly Scott Carter, who already did an initiative report to get the thing going. And uh, as member of parliament is reporting on uh, sustainable finance. Uh, then Catherine de Koning Lopez from uh, Invesco, head of uh, ESG. So really, uh, already working in this field for quite a while. Then Edmund uh, Larkin, head, uh, Deputy Head of Sustainable Investment at HSBC. So let's not forget uh, the banks can also uh, work in this field. And finally, Sophie Barbier, uh, Director of European Affairs at uh, Casa de Depot. And uh, in the end, it is a public-private uh, thing to get the uh, thing going. So a public development bank can really have an, an sparehead role in this, uh, in this uh, area. And Ellen, can I uh, ask you to start off with what are your thoughts um, on the Commission proposals and, and where we are today? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I guess the, we should focus on the how rather than the why yeah. uh, today. But uh, nevertheless, I think it's, it's, it's perhaps useful to just to set the scene to say a few words about the why before we get into the details. Um, first of all, sustainability is, of course, a lot more than just about than just climate change. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a bigger issue, raising, raising uh, social questions and so on. Uh, having said that, climate clearly is, is the focus of our, of our work at the moment, and, and, and clearly that there are good reasons for that. It's, 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 it's one of the most urgent society, societal challenges we face today. We've seen lots of reports coming out recently, uh, both from the IPCC, but the, also the National Climate Assessment in the US, which paint uh, a, a, a picture of the urgency of, of the situation that we're facing. Uh, today is, 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 of course, an important day in this context. The Commission has today adopted its new long-term strategy on climate change. And um, 
it, 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 it points, I think, to the continued uh, desire from the European Commission to show leadership in this area uh, at, at international level. Uh, of course, it, the timing is not a coincidence with the uh, COP24 coming up, uh, but there are also other reasons why, why that is important. The uh, issue, one issue I'd like to highlight about the, the, the new strategy is, is that it, it, it clearly sets out that we need to work on a range of fronts, and this comes back to the, to the how we, we, we achieve it. There is no magic bullet, uh, and, 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 and the, the, there's a range of actions we need to undertake. If I look now at the area of sustainable finance, uh, we see a very much a, a, a reflection of that broader picture. Uh, first of all, in terms of um, the sequencing, uh, similar situation, we are of course addressing sustainability in the broader sense, but clearly there is a sequencing and we are tackling uh, climate change uh, as, as a matter of urgency. That does not mean that the other dimensions of sustainability are forgotten, but clearly this is uh, one key issue that we need to, we need to focus on. Uh, similarly, uh, we have uh, quite a, a range of measures. The, the, the overall objective of, of, of our actions in the field of sustainable finance is primarily to ensure that the private sector can mobilize resources in order to contribute to the transition to, to a low carbon economy. But that, and in that context, legislative proposals are, are of course, uh, legislative measures are of course important, and the Commission uh, last uh, May put forward a, 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 a package of measures, the, the, the three measures of, of which, which you have uh, discussed in your, uh, in, in your presentation. Um, but that is not the only thing we're doing. Uh, we are also uh, addressing uh, other dimensions, such as using uh, financial uh, programs, financial instruments to, to, uh, to contribute to, to the transition to, to low carbon economy. And we're also uh, undertaking non-legislative measures. So for example, in the area that I'm uh, working on most directly, which relates to uh, disclosures and, uh, and non-financial reporting, uh, as we generally refer to, refer to it, we are currently already undertaking work to incorporate the TCFD recommendations uh, in, the, in the guidelines we have, uh, we have published on, on the non-financial reporting directive. Uh, we are also uh, working in the context of uh, the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group to try to drive innovation and identify best practices in reporting. Uh, and of course, there is the broader work uh, that is being done uh, by the technical expert group which is kind of uh, also setting the scene or preparing the ground for the implementation of uh, the, the new proposals. So uh, again, there is no, I think, one magic bullet that can solve all the problems. Uh, and that leads me to the uh, discussion about the taxonomy and in particular some of the criticisms you have, uh, or skepticism maybe is a fair word to, to use uh, concerning the ta taxonomy. Um, I think the taxonomy is uh, an important, even an essential element in, in, in the, the work that we're, we're carrying out. Uh, but again, I think it would be a mistake to see it as the magic bullet and the answer to all the questions. And you have pointed out that in some contexts it may well provide a, a, a particularly useful uh, instrument. In other contexts it may provide a slightly less uh, useful instrument. But I think that's, that, 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 is, that is part of, uh, that, that is, just in the nature of things. Um, so uh, the taxonomy, um, uh, again, is, 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 is an essential element, uh, but I don't think it, it should be seen uh, as, 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 as either the, the, the sole magic bullet or, or, or the, um, the only thing we're doing. A lot depends on how the taxonomy will be used. Uh, it's a question of uh, you know, horses for courses, as I said in English, uh, and you need to adapt, use the right instrument for, for the right purposes. Having said that, the taxonomy is, is a very important element, and of course we do uh, want to make as much progress as possible in, in, in that area. Um, I don't either see any kind of contradiction or opposition between the question of, of passive investment or benchmark-based investment uh, and, and, and active investment. I think both are important. Uh, there is, of course, a much broader debate to be had about passive versus active investment. Uh, the, the, the increasing importance of passive investment raises very fundamental questions in, in, in a more sort of fundamental economic sense about price formation and so on, what do prices mean in an environment where most of the investment is actually passive investment. Um, but uh, I, I don't think that any uh, uh, sort of professional or institutional investor 
uh, would uh, generally uh, treat uh, either the taxonomy or any, any other instrument in a kind of very mechanical way in which this is almost an algorithm where you just crank the handle, put in some numbers and get your answer out of, of the other end. That, that, that would be, I think that would not typically be the way that professional investors would, uh, would, would deal with these kind of things. The, the taxonomy brings additional information that can be factored into investment decisions, uh, but again, I don't think it is ever going to become the only piece of information that is going to be used for that purpose. For that purpose. Uh, and, and so uh, I really want to emphasize that I, I don't see any opposition or contradiction between the, the, the two investment approaches. Um, I think I'll leave it here for the time being. I'm sure we'll have lots of opportunities to have further Thanks questions so afterwards. In the next round, a little bit what the timetable is, but. Uh, I would be happy to go to Molly, who was really uh, at the forefront of this whole movement to sustainable finance uh, from oh, the Green Park. Thank you very much. That's very kind. Um, well, I wanted to start by really congratulating the Commission on the excellent work I think they're doing. And uh, it's really quite exciting for somebody like me, who's an, a green economist, to see the way that insights from ecology and expertise from economics and finance are sort of being brought together now in this uh, really very urgent task of making sure that there's a, a livable planet for, for future generations. And I think there's been tremendous leadership shown by the Commission, and we're trying to, to play our part in the Parliament as well. One thing I would need to say right at the beginning is that, uh, as you pointed out, the focus, the primary focus, I would say, of the sustainable finance agenda is about private money. But that's not a substitute for public money. So I'm probably particularly sensitive to this coming from the UK, where we've had a decade of austerity and cuts. Actually, a lot of what we need to ensure the sustainability transition is public investment in infrastructure. And I think if we see ways in which other policies that we follow as European institutions prevent that, then maybe we need to question those as well as part of the sustainable finance agenda. But essentially, most of what we're dealing with here in these proposals is about using the power of finance as a lever to shift the European economy in the direction of sustainability. So we hear enormous sums of money, if I'm not wrong, Commissioner Dombrovskis' is favourite is 180 billion, somebody will tell me, per year, yeah, um, which is a large amount of money. But um, I think the really important thing to say is that the money's out there. It's just at the moment a lot of it's doing the wrong things. So we have investments in what's destructive and is impacting negatively on the climate. And what we need to do is shift that in the direction of investments in the sustainability transition. So what we're trying to do is to find ways of incentivizing that shift and speeding it up, basically. Um, so I think a good way to think about this initially is to draw a parallel with the divestment movement. So you're probably aware of the fact that you had ethical investors thinking, I don't want my money in fossil fuels anymore. And so campaigns were launched with pension funds and universities and so on to, to persuade them to take their investments out of fossil fuels and arms and tobacco and so on and put it into more sustainable investments. But what we're talking about with the sustainable finance agenda is we're, we're not arguing that people should do that because it's ethical to do that. We're arguing that you should do that because actually if you're holding fossil-related assets, they are essentially stranded assets. They are becoming stranded over time because of our commitment to drive fossil fuels out of our economy by 2050, which I think is what... Uh, Commissioner Cagnete has just announced how we're going to achieve that. Obviously, 2050 is far too late. You know, I've been trying to get people to do this for 30 years, and we're kind of right at the edge of it being possible to, to pr protect the climate at this stage. So it, it feels very urgent, and um, but however urgent it is, the Paris Agreement and our commitment from the Parliament is that we will remove fossil fuels from our economy by 2050. So again, that opens up the possibility of sudden movements in financial markets and destabilization of finance. So the sustainable finance agenda is very much focused on incentivizing an orderly transition. So we know that we're going to be moving in that direction, but we don't, you know, I would, of course, like it all to happen tomorrow from a climate point of view, but that would just cause financial instability. So it's a question of ensuring the most rapid transition away from damaging assets but while respecting the need to maintain financial stability. Um, and of course, we, 
the reason we're moving away from those assets, I mean, it's not because coal doesn't have any use anymore. You know, you can still sit it in your fireplace and set fire to it and it'll keep you warm and you can still put petrol in your car and it'll drive along. We're deciding that those assets won't have a value and that's really important as well because it's very important that we as politicians give a very clear signal to markets that actually we're serious about Paris, we're serious about protecting the climate and we won't go back on those. Otherwise, we're going to have some nasty sort of chicken game with all sorts of financiers and fossil fuel companies and so on. I don't see that happening but it is a risk if we don't speak with one voice as the institutions and be very clear about the signalling. Um, so just moving on quickly to three, the three key issues that are actually coming forward now as legislative proposals. I won't say much about the taxonomy because I don't work on that directly. It's also the most complex, the most sort of intellectually complex. It's, it's quite a challenge. I wouldn't mind working on it, but I'm not actually working on it. So I don't know as much as the other people here probably. But I would completely agree with what Dirk said, and this was the point we made in my initiative report. You don't want a taxonomy that's about boxes and categories and can I fit in that category? And if I can, then I'm fine. Because we need to ensure that it's dynamic dynamic. So what needs to remain fixed is the key sustainability indicators that you're looking at. So whether that's the amount of forest or the amount of carbon emissions or something you can measure scientifically that's an indicator, ecological indicators remain fixed. But the technologies and the processes you, you can use to achieve those in your business practices will change through time because this is an area that's extremely <laughs> dynamic. There's extraordinary developments going on in um, technologies for energy storage, for example, and the interconnector program. And so so we don't want to fix people having, you know, saying, well, they're in that category and that category will remain sustainable forever. So we need to allow the taxonomy to have that sort of dynamism. Um, but I think it's absolutely right to start with a definition. You need to be able to say what's sustainable and that's what the taxonomy seeks to achieve. And I also agree with the way it's set up, starting with climate as the most urgent priority, but then moving on to other environmental priorities and ultimately the social and governance priorities as well. So, um, yes, uh, that's probably enough about the taxonomy, although perhaps the questions will come on that. But the other two proposals are for disclosures and for benchmarks. So the disclosures proposal, I think, is, is really in some ways overdue, because all it's really doing is saying that you as a customer have the right to know what's being done with your money. It was quite, I mean, generally there's been good political agreement in the Parliament, but it was really quite surprising to me that some of my colleagues were arguing for the fact that it was fine that you didn't know what was happening with your money. And after a while, I realized this was because some of the financial institutions actually don't know what they're doing with your money. They just have a large pool, and it goes up and does various things. Now, the reality is, if you give people that information, surveys have shown that they choose to invest their money in more sustainable ways, and they certainly don't want their money in tobacco and arms and fossil fuels and so on. So that's why the disclosures part of the agenda is really important, because if customers have that information, they will choose to switch their money in a more sustainable direction. And they have a right to do that, and they have a right to the information to allow them to do that. So when this proposal reached the Parliament, my colleague and your friend Paul Tang was the rapporteur, and he was determined to extend the scope of the proposal. So we included investee companies and um, all financial services, basically, including banks. Now, that hasn't so far been agreed by the Council, so we're, we're entering... We'll, we'll be voting this next month in the Parliament, and then in the new year we'll be entering into trilogue negotiations. But to my mind, you need to have a level playing field between all financial institutions, and it doesn't make sense to uh, you know, accept some or remit some from the proposal. So I hope that will be accepted. We've also built on the Commission's definition of what is sustainable by inserting references to ES and G factors. So as you would expect from Paul, who's a socialist, MEP, he was very concerned that we include the, the social aspects and also the governance aspects in the proposal, and we supported him in that. And lastly, we've made significant additions in terms of due diligence and the trans and transparency risk policies. So market participants have to have due diligence policies in place in order to assess sustainability risks. Then on the benchmarks, again, as you said, I think this is I mean, I didn't really understand that much about benchmarks when I started working on this, but effectively we're talking about enormous amounts of money flowing, passive investors, as you say. So large pension fund, for example. Somebody told me that the Japanese public pension fund, you can just imagine the size of that, is looking for a sustainable index to follow. And so if we set these up right, we can be attracting vast sums of money into Europe as well as towards sustainable transition in Europe. But in order to do that, 
we have to make sure we get out of the green niche. So at the moment, if you look at indexes as a whole, I think 0.3% of them are sustainable. So it's, it's basically people like me, isn't it? It's the super green kind of tree hugging people that have their money there. Fantastic, people like me are great. But what we want to have is everybody or like large amounts of money going into this space. And so the, the commission sent us two proposals, one for a, a low carbon benchmark and one for a positive carbon benchmark. We thought the whole idea of positive carbon was a little bit strange in terms of terminology. But more importantly, we, don't, we didn't want to exclude ourselves into this green niche. So we're concerned about the, basically the mo most of the economy that's in the middle and how can we put an incentive on that to shift in the direction of sustainability. So what we're proposing is a climate transition benchmark. So a, an index that includes companies who can prove that they are on a trajectory towards Paris alignment by 2030. And so they need to be able to prove that scientifically. We don't want any greenwashing here. But we don't, but for example, if it's a company that by nature is heavily energy intensive, if it makes um, significant investments to reduce its energy dependency, it might still find a place in this index, even though it's not a sector that could ever be considered green and sustainable. That's the kind of objective. And obviously, this again will have to be negotiated in the trilogues and hopefully we'll, we'll come up with something positive. But we really wanted to be more ambitious in terms of the amount of money we're moving, even if it's not um, in companies that are entirely green just now. I'm just, just finishing now. <laughs> so just to conclude, um, what's encouraged me about this agenda is we've had such strong support from industry. And you know I've had all sorts of people coming from banks and finance companies and uh, they're all supportive of what we're trying to achieve. I know they send me the sustainability people, but nonetheless, um, you're, gonna, you're gonna tell us this in a minute. I think that we've got considerable public and private cooperation over this agenda. And I also have been surprised by how much political agreement there is in the parliament. So we, we have you know, our own arguments going on, but essentially we can carry on arguing about what's an appropriate level of profit and how firms should be governed. I don't think we need to carry on arguing about whether we want to protect the climate for future generations. So. Hopefully we can all sign up to this agenda. It seems to be that way so far. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I want to, before I go to the finish, I want to pick up one thing. We argued about an orderly transition, and, and that's very nice of you. And I would add to that, we can only have an orderly transition if we start now, uh, because then you can do it orderly. If you wait too long, then you will find out we are behind, and then you have to make bigger steps. For example, carbon tax. Uh, if you start to increase it now, you can do it in steps. If you wait too long and start then doing it, you have to take bigger steps. So the earlier we start, the more order orderly we can execute uh, this agenda. And that's why, for example, the ECB and national supervisors are really, from the financial stability side, uh, pushing you, uh, the ones from the financial sector, to have your climate data that you know what is happening. Because the earlier you move, uh, the, the, yeah, that's a soft landing scenario, basically. But can I move to you, uh, Catherine? Sure, thanks. Yeah, I think it is on, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, there we go. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you. Uh, for those of you who don't know, in Vasco, we are an almost trillion dollar firm. We uh, just manage uh, money. Uh, that is our core function and really across asset classes. So uh, fundamental equities, fixed income and multi-asset as well as passive and quant strategies, private equity. And, and really we do that for investors globally and manage money f from global regions. Um, I'll just make a few comments on this and I, I, will, I will agree and disagree, Molly. Um, so I, first of all, I, I, I will congratulate this initiative. I think, you know, I'm an ESG specialist. I've been doing this for over 10 years. And really, this is, this is a very exciting initiative for the responsible investment, you know, professionals like myself, but also the industry more broadly. And I think, you know, the, the direction of travel in terms of, you know, incorporating environmental, social, and governance issues into our investment processes are, are, are not questioned, right? We, we, we do that, we want to do that, and we accept that, that we should be doing that, right? Um, I think, it, so to that point, actually these, these initiatives have actually achieved very, very senior level uh, attention 
in in our businesses because they are they are you know they are groundbreaking at the same time um and so you know our ceo our you know heads of legal have have actually looked at this in in you know in a market where where there's a lot of other things going on i think you know congratulations on that um, what what I will say is, uh, I think, and to Dirk's uh, paper around materiality, I, I'll, I'll explain a little bit in terms of how we approach this issue as, at Invesco, and, and it really is about a process versus product, and so we think primarily about the process and incorporating environmental, social, and governance issues into our investment processes, and to do that, we have recognize that we need we need to look at lots of different taxonomies and really come up with our own view because we think you know that is what we are paid to do as investors we we are paid to take a view and we actually believe we have really good insight right to these companies we meet uh in the part of the business that i'm located in in in, in the uk over 3,000 companies a year and we have regular conversations around esg issues and so what we did in, in our business is really we looked at MSCI, Sustainalytics, SASB, the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board in the US. We looked at some brokers, so um, um, several brokers come out with, with different sector level frameworks of you know, E, S, and G indicators that, that people like us should be looking at. And, and I really presented that in several workshops to, to our fundamental equities and fixed income teams and said, well, well this is what all these guys think. What, what do we think? And we've come up then with our own taxonomy based on that. So for 16 different sectors, we have our own view. And I think what was really interesting, and you know, again, I, I do think this really resonates with your paper, what came out um, from our view is actually issues like capital allocation for the future was seen as a, as a very core corporate governance sustainability issues. Issues like product characteristics, what does this company actually do, came out as a really important issue. And those issues are not necessarily features at, as heavily in, in you know, some of those kind of more standardized frameworks. So I think you know, having the flexibility for us as investors to come up with our own view, come up with what we think is important is, is really, really crucial in all of this. And so I think, you, you know, whatever we end up with in terms of a, a you know, final um, text here and decision, you know, keeping that flexibility and, and making sure that the investors that really are speaking to companies every single day have the flexibility to come up with our, our own view. And then the other point I'll make is, look, I, this is about a journey. And I think, you know, the transition is incredibly important. Um, and I think, you know, it's it's right to to focus on investors. But I do think as well that, you know, we have to recognize the, the availability of data. And so the, you know, the um, initiatives around the reporting lab, for example, is, is, a, is a very welcome initiative from our perspective. I have looked at um, uh, some, some data. So I know one of the proposals is around having a, two degree aligned target currently in Europe there are 75 companies that actually have a science-based target so you know if you imagine as a universe for investors like that is a very small universe of, of companies right that is less than 20 percent of say the MSCI Europe for example so so right today that is not it, you know that is a, is a very difficult thing to achieve so I agree that you know we we should be um, aspiring towards that, and I meet companies on a regular basis as well to talk about this and, and how we uh, companies are allocating money towards these initiatives. But today, it is it is it's just not possible, right? Some of the proposals are just not possible to actually implement, and so I think we have to be cognizant of that journey. Um, and and so perhaps I'll leave it there, and then and then hand it over to Edmund. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. Um, so um, I've been working on sustainable finance, public policy and regulatory issues for about four or five years. And actually, if I think about four or five years, could you get a room with 100 people? And I don't think it would really happen. So it shows you actually how kind of um, um, how far we've come. Um, uh, I would agree with a lot of what people have said. You know, this is absolutely about... Um, um, the incentives in the system. We talk about 180 billion annually within Europe. 
from an HSBC point of view, we look at this globally, and we're talking about 90 trillion globally. A lot of that's in emerging markets, and a lot of that's um, actually um, 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 within infrastructure. And I think actually infrastructure as an asset class, as a financing issue, is something that we really kind of need to kind of get to grips with. Um, so I will say a few things on um, taxonomy, and then maybe I can talk a little bit around um, some of the uh, issues that I see um, from the banking sector. Um, the paper is about that kind of balance between mandatory versus the market. Um, we've had that debate for, for, for a couple of years. Taxonomies as we see them in the banking sector, we've seen them in terms of the ICMA green bond principles, we now have the um, green loan principles. We think they work very well as taxonomies, we think that there's rigor there. We're going to move to regulatory system, so let's move to the regulatory system um, and, uh, you know, ensure that we kind of take into consideration the best practice that is there, whether that's from the bond principles, the loan principles, or the range of, you know, um, PRI, the SDG, TCFD, these, you know, a lot of the frameworks and a lot of the reference points are there. There's a lot of work that's gone into them and just making sure that actually we continue to, you know, make it dynamic and, 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 and include that existing kind of best practice um, within it. We've been big supporters of the work that the European Commission has done. We thought the HLEG did a fantastic piece of work. The action plan was very, very clear in terms of where it wanted to um, go next. We've taken the view that the taxonomy is probably one of the most important um, proposals out there, in part because it's seen as a sort of reference point for some of the other kind of initiatives that will be done around um, disclosure or the debate that will be had around um, 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 potential um, changes. And I think um, internationally, if I think of the conversations um, that I've, I've been party to, uh, a lot of the um, international financial centers, regulators are looking at the taxonomy and very interested in terms of how the commission kind of takes that, that, that piece of work forward. Um, so I suppose in terms of taxonomies, um, we kind of have two main sort of points that we, that, that we kind of see relevant to that. The paper is about taxonomy for investors. Um, we've always struggled to understand why um, why taxonomies need to focus on investors um, to such an extent and don't recognize the broader um, financial system as part of this. The way that we look at it is, you know, Paris Agreement is about shifting the global economy. Therefore, you need to shift the financial system. Therefore, it, it doesn't need to be entity specific. Um, it is about all different actors. Capital Markets Union is designed on the premise that there is 70% um, of the bank financing. I, th I think the banks are very actively involved in this. I can talk a little bit about um, some of the work that, um, that, that we've been doing. Um, um, but if you look to what's in Paris this week with the UN, um, the UN uh, um, UNFPA and a lot of work, a lot of the banks are really kind of stepping up and are very engaged in it and actually um, finding a, the kind of correct mechanisms to ensure that the taxonomies work for all financial kind of actors and all kind of products is very, very relevant. Um, the other point, and we've all sort of discussed this, is transition um, as a concept. Um, I think um, we, we've kind of started out with some of this debate only focusing on what's green. That's kind of partly shifted as the narrative has moved to sort of green and brown, but it's almost everything in between and actually ensuring that sort of transition, whether stewardship, as your paper talks about it, or, you know, the investments or lending in those types of companies and the transition that they're on is seen as the, the type of activities that we want to support and therefore um, needs to be um, included within it. If I look at the, the European Parliament's uh, draft taxonomy report, they move from classification um, 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 to indicators, which for me seems to suggest that actually we're moving from something quite binary to something a bit more um, dynamic that sees sustainability and the assessment around it as um, dynamic. That it's not just the sort of what's in and what's out, it's recognizing that there is a journey. And absolutely, you know, we know that this thing is a journey. Um, there's another kind of point, and I will sort of um, try and wrap up my last bits. And I think that we are 
in some danger of, of getting lost of lots of different um, definitions at the moment. Um, your paper um, focuses on ES and G. Um, the Commission's original proposal for all intents and purposes focuses on, on E. Uh, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure is just on climate. If I look at the work that the Network for Greening the Financial System, which is I think about eight to ten central banks, looking at risk management processes within banks, they're focused on C, on, on the kind of climate part of it. Um, if I look at the mandate that the ESAs now, the EBA and ESMA, it's ESG. And I think data is a very important point because it's what feeds into the scenarios. It what feeds into actually understanding um, what the future exposure is, the data from our clients. I, I, I think we just need to be kind of cognizant that we need to, at some point, get to a kind of agreed definition as, as to what it is that we're actually um, trying to focus on. Um, I briefly mentioned the TCFD. I briefly mentioned um, the NGFS. I think um, I always like to sort of come back to the infrastructure point. I think taxonomies are very, very important. We've kind of discussed the way that this is, you know, part of it is around the disclosure um, 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 to customers. I think we can create the kind of perfect system, perfect classification system, perfect understanding of what it is that we want the money to get into. But actually, we need to put as much effort into linking up between the Sustainable Finance Action Plan, the Capital Markets Union, the Energy Union 2050, and actually ensuring that there is that connectivity between the type of infrastructure projects and the projects that we want, and that it has that kind of um, bankability uh, um, connection back to the financial sector. I have many students, so I teach for my new book, Principles of Sustainable Finance, and then a third of the students are then doing their master thesis on it, so it's really exciting that the young generation picks this issue really up. And what, what they find is that management quality is really some kind of intermediate variable. So if you have good management, then you are profitable, but you also are uh, good on environmental and on social issue because it's basically about being forward-looking. So I will suggest that the G is really an, an, an important factor, but as an intermediate to get uh, the outcomes on environmental and social. Uh, yeah, the G, yeah, sorry, the G from governance. And that translates in measurement in management quality and, and, and how you organize it. And, but it's really an intermediate variable. Uh, and the E and the S, I would say, are more end variables, uh, how we can look at it. But then finally, Sophie, what is your take on all this? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. So I'm happy to be here to discuss with you this uh, interesting uh, and important subject. But um, I think it's quite difficult to, to speak after all the others because I have to say something a little bit different uh, uh, on the subject. No, I think that m my point of view will be a little bit slightly different because I think that and uh, I appreciate this in your uh, article, is that sustainable uh, finance is about long-term investment. So uh, I think that you, you, you clearly uh, underline the fact that sustainable finance and long-term investment share uh, key characteristics, long-term horizons, uh, active management, uh, effective engagement with companies, assessment of externalities thanks to a fundamental approach. So it, it is really important and as CDC, as a long-term investors, we have developed a, a responsible investment strategy because of our identity as a long-term investor. For us, it's a way to fulfill our mission of public interest, a way to support uh, national public policies, also a way to protect the value of our investments over the very long term, a way also to answer the clients' demands, our clients' demands, and of course to exercise our responsibilities towards the whole financial ecosystem. So for us, it makes sense, of course, and we could not be a long-term investor unless we are a sustainable investor. Uh, 
I will not come back on what we do exactly, but as you said, it, it uh, encompasses ESG integration in the whole approach of our portfolio, dialogue also with our companies, the companies in our portfolios, and if need be, exclusions for some kind of uh, investments. So to come to get back to the um, the action plan of the Commission, uh, it was also uh, we, we welcome really the attention paid in the action plan to the need to promote a more conducive uh, environment to long term investment. Uh, for instance, and I will pick up uh, other measures than the one uh, which were mentioned previously, uh, we, we welcome the fact that the uh, Commission asked uh, EFRAG to explore alternative accounting uh, methodologies uh, to value uh, investment in equities. So we are going a little bit uh, uh, aside the, the purely uh, sustainable question, but we think it's really important to have this kind of reflection. Uh, as well, um, we, we were also uh, supportive of the, uh, the, the request to the ESAS to collect uh, evidence of the uh, pressure exercised on uh, cooperation by capital markets, the short-term uh, pressure that uh, can also uh, endanger uh, sustainable, uh, sustainable uh, finance. Uh, so maybe uh, I would like to, in, in this respect, insist on two main points. The first one is that we are convinced that a framework more conducive of long-term investment would be favorable to the mainstreaming of sustainable finance. So in this respect, I would like to refer to a report that was recently uh, published uh, by uh, the a task force led by Gerard de Martinière. So it's a French report. It is written also in English. Uh, and you can find it on, uh, on our website in English. So, uh, and it, it is about uh, European policies, in fact, not French policies. Uh, it is important while long-term investment has been uh, recognized as a strategic issues for some years, the EU still shows a persisting uh, deficit of long-term investment. And so we think that we need to boost long-term investment and to, um, for, to, doing, to do so, we need to have a framework complying with four main principles. First of all, repositioning long-term investment adhered of public policy. Second principle, it's, to, it's enabling effective quantification of long-term risks and returns, that is to say, externalities. Third principle, promoting long-term asset, asset and liabilities management, and so to adapt the regulatory framework uh, to this kind of uh, asset, uh, ILM uh, management. And then the fourth principle is to promote the alignment of interests among the, all the participants in the investment value chain. Uh, so I invite you to read this uh, this report. You will find some recommendations, and so uh, it could be. Uh, I will not. Uh, I will not um, give more details uh, here. But please read this report. Uh, then uh, the second point is I would like to stress is the fact that it is important public finance, I think, is important in the process. And in this respect, it is important to, to, uh, to have long-term investors, public long-term investors, national promotional banks and institutions, as you say in Brussels, on board. Because we, uh, as long-term investors, uh, are experiencing, uh, are, are, we are always working on new instruments, new markets, and I think that concerning sustainable finance, uh, we have always been uh, pioneers. Of course, not only CDC, but uh, KFW, uh, uh, CDP, and so on. So I think uh, one of the former CEO of Casa Depot um, 
was referring to, uh, I don't know the English version, maybe you will be able to translate, good la brèche, the, the, the taste for uh, innovation, breakthroughs, maybe. Uh, so I think it's important to rely on public long-term investors because we are key actors in this respect, to, to be to pioneer. Say, at the appetite for breakthroughs, it was my, my guess, but I was not sure. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, so no, I will end with this. I think that often uh, you mentioned, some of you mentioned the financial instruments that are so important in this respect. We consider that we have indeed a leverage effect through financial instruments, but this uh, effect is not only financial, it's also a non-financial uh, leverage effect on the whole ecosystem. Thank you very much, uh, Sophie. I think you managed to add something new because I think you really brought the issue of long term uh, into the debate. And that's exactly, uh, you may know this, uh, the title of, I don't know whether it's the latest, but one of the latest book of Nick Stern, Why Are We Waiting? Because if you uh, invest in, for example, in energy infrastructure, you, you lock in for the next 30 years your energy mix. So that's so it's extremely important why on long-term decisions, including, for example, on, in the Netherlands we have a discussion on, on Schiphol, we want to expand it, but nobody takes into account uh, the emissions and the likely carbon tax in the future, because uh, tickets are now almost free, but with a carbon tax, they will become more expensive and you will have less flights. So, do we take that into account when we take long-term decisions? I think that's the key uh, issue. So thank you for reminding us. If I hear everybody, so I think we have really consensus that the taxonomy uh, can be useful, but at the same time, uh, flexibility and indicators rather than fixed definitions. So Alan, can you elaborate a little bit on that and maybe also give an just an indication of the time frame. So what are the, what, what are the, when, when are we going to see more of the technical expert group and that kind of thing? Yeah, maybe to start with uh, on the question of the, um, the, the dynamic nature of the, of the taxonomy. So I'll just say a few words about that. Um, it's certainly possible to envisage making the, the taxonomy more dynamic than we originally envisaged it. But I think it's important to highlight that we did not have a static vision of the, sta of the taxonomy in the proposal that we made. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the taxonomy would be a living document. It would be updated, uh, both in terms of the scope that it covers. So we proposed having a review to widen the scope also to, to social uh, issues, um, but also in terms of the substance. Uh, it's not that we would develop a taxonomy, adopt it once or publish it once, and then never look at it again. So there was always an intention that this would be a living document that would need to be updated to take into account technical developments and economic developments. Uh, so that's, uh, I, I think it's, it's important to, to, to state that. Now, now of course, there is, a, there is a debate ongoing in the, in the, in the European Parliament in particular uh, on, on this point, and, and we'll have to see where, where, that, where that lands. Um, on, on the timing, um, as I mentioned before, we uh, are not uh, standing still during the negotiations of the, the, the proposal in, in the Parliament. The technical expert group is, is working at full speed on this. Um, as you know, the technical expert group is, is, is working on a number of work streams. The taxonomy is one of them, but there are a range of others. Uh, the one that I'm more closely involved with is, is the, the work stream on disclosures related to climate change. Uh, that uh, uh, will report earlier than the other work streams because we need that, uh, that, that product earlier in order to integrate it uh, in the, in the non-binding guidelines we will issue in, uh, in, in June of next year. Um, on the, uh, the uh, work uh, that the TEG is doing on the, the taxonomy, uh, the TEG is intended to work until uh, the month of June. Uh, produce a proposal at that stage, which will be kind of a, a you know a, a starting a starting basis for, for for the future discussion of the taxonomy. That then has to be uh, turned into a uh, delegated act, uh, as, as we foresaw it in the proposal, uh, once the the level one text is is adopted, uh, and uh, that timing will of course depend a little bit on the uh, the speed with which the discussions in the Parliament and the Council proceed on the on the taxonomy. Uh, the Commission has always uh, 
uh, pushed for, for this, uh, this proposal to be adopted as quickly as possible. Um, our, our, our hope was that it would be possible to finalize these negotiations uh, before the uh, elections uh, of next year. Uh, I think it's to be seen now whether that is, that is, that is still fe feasible. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, that is of course a, a more difficult question. Uh, but, uh, but in any case, we are committed to delivering on this uh, as, as, as quickly as possible and we are not standing still while the negotiations are ongoing in the Council and Parliament. Okay, thanks a lot. What I would like already to do, if, if there are uh, questions from the floor, so we can uh, get new perspectives into the debate. We have a microphone. Is there anybody who uh, has a question, wants to know more? So then the panel has been crystal clear. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, then I will kick off. Um, uh, Molly, you introduced this topic of uh, stranded assets. Yeah? So by 2050, we stopped with uh, fossil fuels and already before. And I would really like to ask the people from the private sector, how, how is that on your radar, this, this stranded assets? Of course, you, your bank loan is maybe only five years out, but how is the industry looking at this issue of stranded assets? So, so I'll, I'll comment on um, and also the... Um, the, the topic of um, divestment as well, and I think, look, it is, it's a big debate, right? And I think it's not, you know, it's not just happening here, I think it, it is happening everywhere. Um, what I will say, and this is from personal experience, is I meet um, oil and gas companies, fossil fuel companies, on a very regular basis. We have uh, extensive dialogue around uh, particularly capital allocation for the future and science-based targets. And, uh, for example, I met one company recently that have a target and say, you know, to 2020, and they say to meet this target, we need to allocate 2.5 billion in low carbon business, right? And then they have a science-based target to uh, 2040 as well. If you extrapolate, that is a 30 billion allocation just from this one company to reach a science-based target, right? And this is so, I think what we have to think about is actually these companies are arguably part of the solution, right? They are making these commitments. They are actually saying, look, we are part of the solution here. We are allocating capital. And I, I think that's, you know, the, the transition and the direction of change is really where we're focusing as investors. And that's, that's where we think it's best aligned with the investment opportunity as well. And I think that's coming close to reality because in the end we, we have a few front runners and that's great. But in the end you want your existing industry base, or most of it, eh? we have creative destruction, but most of it is able to reform and make the transition. Because we need the companies also for the future. Yes, and I think it's active investors yeah. that are holding companies to account and having these dialogues with companies, right? As as but but that are part of the solution. Yeah. And I yeah. think if you if you divest, then you're probably not having those dialogues. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, a, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, now you can say something on it, and then we go to the okay. question. Okay. Um, so I think it's a really important question: which sectors will survive the transition and which won't? Um, coal mine won't, that's obvious, it's going to be phased out in the next five to ten years if we're going to have any hope of addressing climate change and keeping the climate within a, a livable um, warming limit. Um, but most other sectors will be able to make that transition. You know, if, if, I was a, if I was an oil company, I would be rapidly shifting my business. I'm not saying shut down all the oil wells tomorrow, but they do need to be rapidly shifting into the renewable technologies of tomorrow. Because, um, because that's already agreed. That's what Paris means. And I think some companies are sort of hoping that we're not really serious about Paris and sort of gambling the future of the climate on the weakness of politicians. Obviously, I'm sitting here as a green saying this. Um, and I think others are just not quite woken up to this. But companies that don't wake up and make that transition do not have a long-term future. And I also speak to these companies, and some of them have woken up to that, some of them unfortunately not. But all, in almost, you know, we're, we're going to need electricity, we're going to need mobility, we're going to need buildings. All of these things will carry on. It's just the way in which they're provided will change. So, you know, we're likely to have more public transport and electric cars. You know, less people driving cars, more shared transport. The cars that there are won't be internal combustion engines. So we'll see a shift, but we'll still need mobility. And I think 
what companies need to do urgently is just think about what that means for the sector they're in. And then if you're financing those companies, you need to look into your portfolio and see which companies are responding, as you said, in a well-managed kind of future-proofed way to these changes and which ones are hoping it's not really going to happen because the, the second lot are the lot that aren't a good investment. Yeah, thanks. Let me just go to the question and then we... There's a question in the back. Okay, thanks. Can you state uh, who you are? Yes, I'm Stefanos Milashi, and I work as staff in the European Parliament. We, we can hear it. The try can. going to turn you on over there. Okay, try again. Yeah. Okay. Great. I'm uh, Stefanos Milashi, and I work as staff in the European Parliament. Uh, I have a few questions, but try to go online. Um, uh, last week, there was uh, a conference in the European Parliament about uh, the sustainable finance. Uh, one of the speakers, uh, more precisely, was the CEO of Allianz, and uh, just suggested uh, and just advocated, please uh, try to put more tax on, extern on externalities. Uh, which is a subject that uh, like I don't hear a lot when there are conference debate on sustainable finance, but I think uh, it can give also a push to the sustainable finance because it's a way also to give value to what can be dangerous for the, for the environment. Uh, the second question is that it's related to this question because uh, the finance and also this kind of uh, eventual taxes anyway is uh, something that should interact in a globalized world. So how the market pressure coming from other parts, other regions of the world, and here I'm referring mainly to China that is already advancing on sustainable finance, can help to speed up our sustainable finance. I know that there are already some collaboration like the uh, European Investment Bank. Uh, third point, what, what can be uh, obstacle or difficulties that can slow the process of the uh, of these three proposals and I'm, I'm particularly referring to the council to what um, can be in the council thanks thank you Mister, uh, let's just check whether there are more questions because we can take a few oh, yeah one question more uh, so, um, sorry, Andreas Dimmelmeyer, PhD student at the University of Warwick. Perhaps one a small question I heard uh, on, on engagement. So, uh, I was at the uh, OECD conference on, on green fines a couple of weeks ago, and there was one uh, person from the Church of England from their uh, pension fund who said that part of their engagement was also uh, to kind of look at the lobbying that uh, their investee companies do to check whether they are uh, kind of consistent with uh, things like pricing externalities. So I wanted to uh, ask you whether you have done anything on this or whether this figures in, in your co uh, considerations. Thank you. Then I start with Sophie because she wanted to say something on the earlier topic. No, it was, yes, it was related to stranded assets. Maybe it was just to give a, an illustration of what yeah. CDC do in this field. And so, uh, first of all, uh, divestment from uh, coal, indeed, it's the first uh, thing. Then uh, we try also, we have a target to reduce our uh, carbon uh, foot, the carbon footprint of our portfolio by uh, 20% uh, until 2020. Uh, then uh, we have also uh, the, our engagement policy. So I, I cannot be uh, so precise as to say what we are engaging with, uh, on what we are engaging with our companies, but we engage on, I think, on disclosure and on their uh, strategy related to uh, climate change. And um, and then uh, the last thing, which is important also, we are, but really difficult, is we are trying to um, uh, integrate uh, the climate change risk into our risk models. That is to say, to take into account this kind of risk uh, from a material perspective. And uh, it's quite difficult. We need data, we need assumptions, and we need new models, uh, but uh, it's uh, the way uh, forward because our uh, risk model is key uh, to define then our allocation uh, of assets. 
And so I think it's part of the answer, even if it's a more difficult uh, answer to the question. So sorry for... Uh, and part of it, the because it's difficult, because you need forward-looking indicators and all the model people will pass data. And this is really about the future mm -hmm. where historical data are not helping at all. Mm -hmm. So the big issue, it is really a pity uh, the council is not here because then we would, could ask them when they will start uh, increasing uh, ETS and decreasing the allowances, but can I start with you, Molly, on the carbon tax? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we discussed this before. I'm a big fan of the carbon tax. Imagine where we'd be now if we'd passed the carbon tax proposal in 1992. Um, the reason we didn't do that was because it requires unanimity in the council, as all tax measures do, and um, various countries opposed it then, and it's really very sad that they did. So we have this ETS, where the price has collapsed twice. It's still only 20 euros a tonne, which is nothing like high enough. And we have that because that was able to be passed by qualified majority voters. Voting. So, I, I mean, I think that tax is just one of the most easy and efficient ways to create incentives in the economy. So, uh, I mean, I already mentioned the frequent flyer levy. Uh, we also need to have tax on aviation fuel at the moment. Aviation is an extraordinary free ride. It's not included in the ETS. You know, you don't pay, at least in Britain, you don't pay tax on aviation fuel as other fuels do. So it's extraordinary that we're encouraging aviation when it's the one thing we most do that's most damaging to the climate and it produces 10 times as much carbon emissions per kilometre travelled as travelling by train. About 60 euro for a European ticket and up to 400 for an international ticket if you take 100 euro uh, as carbon uh, mm -hmm. price. There we go, that's a but good statistic. But you add to a ticket. Um, but I just wanted to say as well, the reason it didn't pass, the reason it's hard to arrange these things is because countries don't want to become uncompetitive with each other, even within the single market and then beyond the single market. So we have to combine the carbon tax with an external border adjustment. And now is a really good time to do that because of Trump launching, not only coming out of the Paris Agreement, but launching a, a trade war as well. So this should be our response, in my view. Um, China is an extremely difficult question. Obviously, the reason that renewables have become much more efficient and affordable in Europe is because China is producing them cheaply and at vast scale. But on the other hand, what do we really believe about Chinese green bonds? You know, do we actually think they're green? How, do, how can we check that? Um, and also, we know that any achievements China makes in terms of environment have enormous spillovers onto S&G. I mean, they don't have human rights. They're not a democracy. People are cheap. People's health is sacrificed, etc., etc. So I'm not that convinced by China's green credentials. Although I'm not somebody who says we won't do anything because China's setting up a new power station every day, because that's nonsense. China is investing very strongly in renewables, and that's shifting the whole world market for renewables. And then on engagement, the Church of England. I'm going to have to criticise the Church of England now. That's a dangerous thing to do. I mean, it's always a, a trade-off, isn't it, with engagement and divestment. And I think whether, whether st keeping shares in a company so you can try and change what that company's doing really depends on whether you think that company, A, is likely to change, and B, should survive the transition anyway. So there's not much point in, in you know, if you're the Church of England, you shouldn't have money in gambling, tobacco, arms, or fossil fuels, clearly. But I'm afraid I think they probably do. But on the other hand, you know, if you then have, um, if you, let's say you were, you had uh, shares in RWE or something, you can now start to, to push for more renewables using your shares, using your voting power and so on. So I think you need to make, you can't just use that as an excuse for hanging on to shares unless you are using them in an active way and you can shift that company in a useful direction. If I can add, because your research is great, that this really a big issue now on engagement, how to measure success. So for the for investors themselves, so you 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 go around to British companies, and how do you measure your success? And when is the point reached when there is no follow up that you do the investment? And that's really an open question. And can I also ask from experience from this side, what is your experience on, on engagement? So I will talk about this slightly less from an engagement point of view, but, but I think to go back to some of the points that have been made around um, um, risk management, I think. So if I take some of the points that have been made and I would look and apply that to how uh, we are looking at this from a bank's point of view, uh, one of the things that we have committed to do is um, understand um, what transition risks means for our clients which is essentially looking um, currently at the um, six um, um, most emitting sectors. And we're coming up with the framework to actually understand what transition risk means so we can 
feed that in um, to the sort of the broader work that we do within our um, risk management work. Um, earlier, when we were talking about the difference in um, definitions that we were seeing, you spoke about um, governance. I think governance is key within this because I think um, um, to the point that kind of um, Sophie made, it's about understanding actually how climate risk is, you know, it manifests itself through the risk management process. You know, one of the first things that was said to me as I was doing the kind of TCFD is, is what needs to happen with the TCFD is it needs to move sustainability from sustainability into finance and risk and, and audit. And if um, anybody has looked at the recent uh, Bank of England PRA supervisory statement, their, their approach is to say, we want this to be discussed at the board level, and therefore, because it gets treated as a risk, like other risks, and therefore, it actually gets into the mainstream of the organization. And that's where some of the other broader um, central bank work is looking at to sort of, you know, if you understand your risks, you better understand the opportunities. And then through the risk, we can begin to deal with some of those data points, so we can deal to begin to do with the scenario analysis on a much better basis. Um, I think, you know, um, but this is all about um, collaboration at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, you know, no one firm or no individual regulator will claim to have all the answers, and actually it's kind of sharing all that, that kind of expertise that, that uh, matters most. And I can add to that that in this network of green and financial systems, I've had two meetings I attended in, in the last month uh, in Berlin and France. Even the most conservative central banks are moving on this topic, so they're really getting on. And uh, climate stress has will be rolled out to the financial sector so to really see uh, a bit like Bloomberg type is your uh, portfolio uh, to degree proof or not. And uh, so in that sense, it is really uh, catching on. make a few comments. Um, so just specifically on, on the engagement question um, and how we measure it. So we have, whenever we start a kind of targeted engagement with a company, um, we, we'll have an objective with that. And so the success is measured for, from achieving that objective. And I'll give an example. Um, I met uh, with an Indian port operator, for example, that um, we felt was not disclosing enough around um, particularly health and safety. They had had an incident and we felt, look, we need as investors more information around health and safety incidents. And, and over a time period, again, to sort of see the direction of change, as that is really where, where we're most interested. And so through dialogue, both with the, the CEO um, and uh, separate meetings with investor relations, um, the next corporate responsibility report that came out from this company actually had three-year health and safety data, but not only health and safety, also environmental data. And so I would say, you know, that is a that is a measure of success because, you know, they, we achieved what we wanted to achieve with our conversation with this company. Um, that now, what I will say, there has been academic research. Um, we have a partnership with uh, the University of Cambridge, and only around 20% of engagements are, are successful. But when you do have um, a, a successful engagement, you, you, you're likely to see an upside on, on your returns. That, that, that's what this um, study showed. Um, but also that engagement, on average, takes about uh, almost two years. So, you know, engagement is a long-term game. Back to the, you know, long to being long-term investors is incredibly important to really uh, achieve these kind of transitions that we're, we're hoping for. Specifically on the on the lobbying question, we do. You know, I think this is this is particularly a shareholder resolution issue in the in the U.S. Um, we do uh, see a lot of companies that get this um, resolution to to have greater disclosure, and and we we regularly support the way we vote is on a case by case basis. We regularly support those types of resolutions. Um, and then I, just the China point. I know we're sort of moving around a little bit here, but. China, I think the energy systems change and transition that's happening right now has been instrumental in terms of the gas, the moving more towards LNG. Now, it's still a very small percentage of their overall energy mix, but the price of LNG has actually increased largely due to, to Chinese demand for, for LNG. And that, you know, our, you know, gas is a lot lower carbon intensity than 
well, certainly coal and, and oil, right? So um, as a transition fuel, I think it is well accepted that gas is an important solution. So in that sense, you know, they, they have already had an impact. Before I move to Ellen, I would want to put one extra question on the table is uh, because at, at Broca we want to not only look at the current horizon, but even beyond that. And if at the forefront we do this investment, we put it in the duties and we do it in the selection, we do the engagement. In the end, the outcome uh, is in the, could be in the reports of the companies and that's this notion of integrated reporting because we now talk about the non-financial part. So you have some indicators next to your financial part. Integrated reporting really means uh, that the social and environmental is fully integrated. And if you do it 100%, you even put it inside the balance sheet, and the happiness of your employees, your impact on the environment, positive and negatively. And just, Ellen, uh, because you want to say something else, but in addition, I would like to, how do you see this horizon towards integrated reporting? Yeah, uh, it's, it's certainly an issue we're looking at. Uh, I think the non-financial reporting directive was kind of a first step in that direction. Um, of course, it's, uh, it's only a first step. And what we're seeing in practice is that because of the results of the negotiations, and in particular some of the options that were put into the yeah. directive, what we're seeing is that quite a lot of companies are electing not to put this kind of information into their management reports in, in an integrated yeah. manner, but rather publishing it as a separate report, yeah. which perhaps is not the, the best solution. Now, um, looking at the bigger picture on, 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 on integrated reporting, I think there is clearly still an expectations gap from users of, of, of company reports um, in terms uh, not only of the scope of information, but also in terms of what that information actually conveys. Uh, traditionally, uh, company reports have been retrospective, uh, sort of confirmatory value, uh, and increasingly what we're seeing is a demand for more forward-looking information. So that's clearly a trend uh, that we are going towards. It's even a trend that you're seeing now uh, co coming up in accounting standards. For example, the new uh, IFRS standard on financial instruments uh, is to a large extent, the innovation in that standard is largely the fact that it will integrate more forward-looking information about potential credit losses. So it, 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 it's a broad trend. Uh, the, uh, in terms of scope, I think there is also, that, that trend is also clearly there. Whether we will move to fully integrated uh, reports in the near term, I think, is very much an open question. That question is on the table. Uh, it is part of the, uh, it's one of the issues we're looking at uh, as part of the fitness check that we're currently doing on, on corporate reporting legislation. Uh, we'll publish the results of that fitness check in, towards the middle of next year. And that will then provide a basis uh, for uh, potential actions uh, that we will uh, potentially carry out, carry out during the next, uh, the mandate of the next college. Um, I, I think it would be premature at this stage to really put my uh, money uh, on, 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 on what the outcome exactly yeah. will be uh, of that debate, but clearly that is the trend and the direction of travel. It's just a question of how quickly does that yeah. progress uh, and how quickly do we get to a result that everybody satisfies with. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And on that note, I would like to close at spot on 2.30. Uh, what I found most remarkable that we didn't have any big fights on this panel, and normally we try to get that, because, uh, but it shows that the public and the private sector are really aligned. And I think uh, some of the speakers said that on the panel, and I think that's really good news. Uh, I think uh, we should also be clear that we make it happen. Uh, so no greenwashing, but really that it happens. So we are not yet there, so, uh, but I think the progress has been very uh, fast, I think, from the commission, from the political side, I think from the industry there is also some real leadership and that's really exciting to see. And uh, so we did the why last year, the how uh, this year, so probably uh, we're going to do the harvest next year. And uh, can you share me in thanking the panel for really, uh, really nice contributions? Thank you. Yeah.